Like it or not, Israel is one of those countries that more often than not ends up in the news. That has been the case since its founding in 1948, but has become even more so since 1967, when the Six-Day War saw Israel occupy the Sinai, Gaza Strip, Golan Heights, the West Bank of the Jordan River, and most controversially, East Jerusalem. Yossi Klein Halevi is an Israeli journalist born in the United States who has just published a book in which he traces the lives of several paratroopers who found themselves crossing into East Jerusalem. The book is called Like Dreamers, the story of the Israeli paratroopers who reunited Jerusalem and divided a nation. And we welcome Yossi Klein Halevi back to our program. It's so nice to have you back here oh, it's again. It's so good to be with you, Steve. You, you were on our previous program as well. I think this might be your third or fourth visit here. I believe so. So yeah. we're, we're, we're glad that you stayed up all night long and flew just to be here today. <laughs> Uh, your book, you know, is getting some great notices. It's being hailed as one of the two or three best books ever about Israel. And you tell the story that you tell by looking through the eyes of seven paratroopers. And let's start with this. How did you choose those seven? It took about two years into the project before I realized who the main protagonists were. The book took 11 years to write. And, and one of the main challenges was sorting through 2,000 men who had fought in the battle for Jerusalem. And eventually, I, I decided to focus on two groups. One group of uh, former paratroopers who became leaders of the West Bank settlement movement on the right. And the other group became leaders of the Israeli peace movement on the left. And telling the story of, of Israel's internal schism between left and right through seven men who fought wars together, not only 1967, they went on to fight the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and we're now 40 years observing the 40th right, right now. Right to the month. Literally, that's yeah. right. And, and these were the guys who actually won the Yom Kippur War. They crossed the Suez Canal in the middle of the war <laughs> and, uh, and, and turned the battle uh, against, against the Egyptian army. And so to take seven men who participated in these mythic conflicts and, and then to try to understand Israel's domestic issues, Israel's internal conflicts over identity, over borders, through these guys who, who, who won these wars, I felt was, was a, for me at least, it was, a, 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 it was, a, it was interesting enough to keep, to keep me going for 11 years. Yeah, I think you described them as spiritual elites. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, you have, they come out of really two, two camps, the left and the right. The right comes out of a, a movement known as religious Zionism. And this was a movement that saw what, for most Zionists, was a secular movement. They saw Zionism in religious terms. And some of them were actually messianists. They believed that in the, in the Jewish return to Zion, the, the messianic process literally would be triggered. And that became the basis, or part of the basis, for the West Bank settlement movement. The other movement, the peace movement, came out of what we used to call in Israel, really, the, the kibbutz movement. Mm -hmm. And the kibbutz was an agrarian socialist commune. Uh, and the, the kibbutz movement helped establish the state of Israel. It was once the avant-garde of, uh, of, of, of Israeli society. And uh, an extraordinary phenomenon. It has now been largely privatized, mm -hmm. uh, as so much else has. And uh, the kibbutz is, seems to have gone the way of the 20th century. But in, in Israeli society, in these critical decades that I'm writing about, the kibbutz movement still had that vitality and really carried so much of the Israeli story. And so the book becomes, uh, a, a, it becomes the story of, of the settlement movement on the one hand coming out of the messianic religious right, mm -hmm. and the kibbutz movement, the peace movement, coming out of the socialist uh, secular left. Just to follow up on the kibbutzniks, because I think they were only about 4% of the population, exactly but they right. punched well above their weight. Why oh, did they yeah. have such clout in the country? Well, they, they were raised on, on an ethos of service, of national service. And so the paratroopers who were in, in these years of the, the first decades of the state were, were the, the elite fighting unit of Israel. 50 plus percent of the men were from these agrarian communes. Uh, upwards of 70% were off, of the officers' corps were kibbutzniks. And this ethos of, of service, which began in childhood, when they were, when they were raised to, to see themselves as the elite of, 
of the Jewish return home and as the, the incubator of, of, of democratic socialism. Uh, they, they, they imbibed this ethos of service and then became uh, really leading figures in the military and then in the peace movement. One of your religious paratroopers is um, out of a religious center in Jerusalem run by a rabbi named Tzvi Yehuda Koch. How would you describe his significance? He was a very a, a fascinating and complicated character. He was someone who, on the one hand, was um, deeply pious, almost, almost ultra-Orthodox in his appearance. So black garb and... Black garb, black hat, long beard. white beard. Mm -hmm. And yet, on the other hand, had a deep love for, for every Jew. He was, he, was, he was working out of a particular theology that made place for every Jew, no matter how secular. And he loved the kibbutzniks. Mm. And he taught his students to, to, to reach out to them on a, on a principle of indiscriminate love. And so that was, that was one side of Rabbi Tzvi. That would Rabbi not Tzvi be the case Rabbi. today, would it? Much less so, yeah. much less so. And the other, the other side, and this is really how he's remembered more of it, I'm glad that you, that you raise him because I think that he's a much more nuanced character than the way Israeli society remembers him today. Israeli society recalls the Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook, who was militantly, really, really fiercely uh, advocating West Bank settlement and the annexation of the territories. So he injected himself into Israel's most bitter internal debate between left and right, but there was this <coughs> other side of him, a much softer, more embracing side. And that's part of the story I'm trying to tell in this book is a nuanced tale of Israel that goes deeper than what we think of as left and right. And the protagonists in this book, many of them, don't stay in the same place. Mm. They start out right wing, they end up center left. They start out left wing, they end up skeptical of the peace process. And it's that dynamism uh, of Israeli society that tends to get lost when Israel is translated abroad. Well, the author has made a similar kind of journey, has he not? He has. <laughs> <laughs> Politically, ideologically speaking? Yeah, I mm -hmm. would say that I've covered at this point in my life most of the points <laughs> along the political spectrum. Uh, I grew up uh, as a teenager in Brooklyn, New York, uh, the son of a, uh, of a very angry Holocaust survivor. Uh, and the way in which I processed the, the Holocaust, and we're talking about the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, was to join the most militant uh, right-wing Jewish group, the Jewish Defense League of Rabbi Meir Kahana. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, saw, I saw that as, as, as my way of coping with this overwhelming legacy. And over the years, I began to distance myself from militant politics. But because of that experience, I'd say I have a soft spot or at least an understanding for, for radicals in whatever flavor. <laughs> and, and that actually helped me write this book because uh, I'm dealing with left-wing radicals, right-wing radicals. And there you are happily in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where <laughs> I place myself now is very much in the middle. Uh, I, I'm, I identify strongly with the center of the Israeli map. But emotionally and, and in terms of personality, I, I resonate with the radical persona. Let's bring another character from your book ahead now, Yoel bin Nun whom we meet as a 12-year-old, mm -hmm. confiding to someone that I want the temple to be rebuilt. Yes. That is his deepest longing. Can you put that into some context for a, a, a general audience that may not understand what that means in a Jewish context? Well, you know, the, the general perception, if you, read the, if you read the Western media, about what the holiest Jewish site is, is the Western Wall. In fact, the Western Wall was never a holy site. It, it was always a poor substitute for the Temple Mount on top, which is where uh, Jews have, have prayed toward for 2,000 years. And the exile from the Temple Mount was seen as the deepest spiritual wound in Judaism. Now, there's a problem with the Temple Mount and the Jewish, this deep Jewish attachment to it, which is there's now another religion that is deeply uh, in, entrenched on the Temple Mount. And so my feeling is as a, as a Jew with, with, strong, with strong religious feelings, is that 
I understand our longing for the Temple Mount, but I prefer to confine that to the symbolic realm. And, uh, and I'll say, God forbid that we should ever try to actualize our, our spiritual claim to the Temple Mount in political terms, because that's a volcano in the Middle East. And so I, I have one of my main characters starts out as a passionate advocate of, a Jewish, of the return of the Jewish claim to the Temple Mount. And the book traces his evolution from, I'd say, a ra radical right to, uh, to a much more nuanced centrist. And he's, mm. he's the character I personally most identify with. In the For book. sure. Yeah. We encounter all seven in June of 1967, part of the 55th Brigade, which was given the order to cross into East Jerusalem. Avital, another of your seven main characters, uh, thought the war was going to last for several months. I gather the quote is, at best he thought the IDF would fight the Arabs to a draw. Instead, Israel won on every front in six days. What was the effect of Israel's victory on the two groups? The, in, in, in a way, that is the seminal question in terms of understanding the next 40 years of Israeli history. Because the religious Zionists emerge from the Six-Day War convinced that a divine miracle has just saved Israel. And, and it was widely embraced in Israeli society, even by many secularists. People spoke in the summer of 1967. I, the first time I visited Israel was that summer. I was 14, and I stepped into the messianic, the, the, the era of redemption. Everyone in Israel seemed to be using the language of miracle. Israelis, even the most secular Israelis, were speaking in a quasi-theological language. And so it was a natural assumption for the more orthodox Israelis to make that, that explicit and say, well, if, if God is in this story, if, if, if we've been, been uh, privileged to experience a miracle, and not just a miracle, but this was, bear in mind that Jews for 2,000 years dreamed of a return to Jerusalem. Now, the Jews were the most powerless people on the planet. And so this, this was always in the realm of fantasy. And now suddenly, the Jews have an army. We're back in the land. And we're back in Jerusalem winning a war which everyone expected Israel to lose. You're facing armies surrounding you. You're, you're barely three million people. Israel in those years was, was an agrarian, semi-industrial uh, country. There was no high tech. There was no high tech Israeli miracle. No startup nation. Yet. No startup nation <laughs> anywhere on the horizon, mm -hmm. and and Israel was was pretty much of a third world country in those years, populated by immigrants. More than half of Israel's population were Jews from Arab countries, uh, and and there was really this sense of the fragility of Israel. And now suddenly, within six days, Israel becomes the regional power. So psychologically, we weren't ready for it. And, and my, my understanding, and this is something that I, I try in some way to convey in terms of the psyche of, of Israel, uh, is that we are a people in the grips of, manic, of certain manic depressive syndrome. Uh, we, we go from fears of destruction to these extraordinary victories. <clears throat> and in a way, that is built into the Jewish psyche uh, from our experience in the 20th century. We moved from the Holocaust to, to Israeli independence in three years. Mm. The Holocaust ends in 1945, and in 1948 we have a state. <clears throat> that, that comeback is simply astonishing. Mm. And, and it, the psychic toll of that abrupt reversal of fate is that we, we constantly veer between these fears of another Holocaust and this, and this sense of imminent redemption. Mm. And so in the summer of 67, one camp, the religious Zionists, who then become the, the nucleus of the, religious, of, the, of the settlement movement, the West Bank settlement movement, take this messianic idea, we have just been redeemed by God. Now we have to do the next step. We, we need to redeem the land that we have just conquered. This is the ancient biblical land of Israel, and we need to simply reclaim it. That's one camp. The other camp, the more skeptical, the secular camp, the kibbutzniks, the peace camp, say, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> we won this war because 
Jews finally stopped praying for, for redemption and took their own fate in their hands. So their conclusion about the victory of 67 is exactly the opposite. This wasn't a gift from God. Israel is a gift that the Jewish people gave themselves. And as a result of that, we need to be very careful. First of all, we need to play by the rules, not by religious rules. We're now back in political history. The Jews have returned to history. That imposes certain responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities is to free yourself from the old Jewish fantasies of messianism and to start becoming political realists. All right, part of political realism was <clears throat> you're now in control of a bunch of Palestinian Arabs in East Jerusalem. You have control over the entire city after 1967, and I gather there are a variety of options as to what to do about that. And over the West Bank and Gaza, mm -hmm. you're, you're a population of three million Jews now has a million Palestinians who don't want to be part of Israel, and the Israelis don't want as part of their society. Right. So now the question is, what do you do? So these two camps <clears throat> emerge, and the book chronicles through these seven lives. It tells the story of Israel's dilemmas as experienced by the men who delivered the victory. And it traces the, <clears throat> the, the ways in which these seven men grapple with precisely that question. 45, 46 <clears throat> years later, Israel and its neighbors still have not figured out what to do about this land and these people. That's right. right. Fair exactly. to say? Very fair to say. No consensus on what to do. Well, I would say that in Israeli society, 45 years later, we have a kind of a centrist majority that's emerged. And this new centrist majority basically believes two things. One is that Israel desperately needs a two-state solution. We need a Palestinian state in order to free ourselves from being occupiers, in order to, free, to allow Israel to remain a Jewish and democratic state with a Jewish majority. <clears throat> so that's one principle that the centrist majority accepts. And that, of course, is the victory of the Israeli left. The other idea that the center has, has, has embraced is a right-wing idea, which is that the Palestinian national movement and the Arab world generally is nowhere near ready to accept the legitimacy of a Jewish state in any borders. But most of what we hear nowadays about these so-called occupied territories uh, focuses on the settlements that have been established there by the state of Israel and I guess inhabited mostly by, um, well, I, I shouldn't assume this. I was going to say mostly by religious people who... Not necessarily. But not necessarily. It might be people looking for cheap housing, right? That's exactly. the other side of it. Exactly. But when did that... You, uh, Israel captured this land in 1967. At what point did these settlements start to become a real thing? Well, it's a, that's a really important question because <clears throat> the assumption is that the settlement movement begins immediately after the Six-Day War. Now, there are a few isolated settlements that are established uh, in the early years after the Six-Day War. For the most part, the government of Israel, which was a left-wing government in those years, it was headed by labor, uh, is, is putting a strong break on, on this settlement impulse and the would-be settlers are increasingly frustrated. Then in 1973, the Yom Kippur War breaks out. And that it becomes Israel's most traumatic war. Israel is caught in a surprise attack on two fronts, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. And Israel is totally unprepared for this war. We almost lose the state. And the trauma that Israelis experience as a result of this war, even though we emerge from the war victorious, the memory of those early days in which, in which we were facing these, these invading armies and were seemingly helpless creates a, a totally new mood in Israel. And one consequence of that is a hardening of the Israeli attitudes. And the settlement movement emerges not after the euphoria of the Six-Day War of 1967, but after the, the, the almost apocalyptic, fearful atmosphere of 1973. Mm -hmm. And the settlement movement is an attempt to establish secure borders for Israel. Bear in mind that Israel, before 1967, is eight miles wide. Now, that's, I, I, I don't think Canadians can understand that you can drive, even today, you can drive the length of the state of Israel in eight hours. North-south. North-south. <clears throat> and, and east-west, even with the West Bank, two hours. And without the West Bank, in 15 minutes. Mm 
And so there was the sense of, of acute vulnerability. So here's a country with very narrow borders <clears throat> before 67, mm -hmm. surrounded by countries who want to destroy it. That combination, in some sense, becomes the foundation for the settlement movement in 1973, saying we cannot go back to those precarious borders. Mm -hmm. Now, many Israelis resonate with that argument. But what the settlement movement fails to provide an answer for is, what do you do with the now 2 million Palestinians who live within those borders? And in one sense, we need those borders for our most basic security. But what does that do to our society? What does mm -hmm. it do to, to the moral ethic, to the moral standing of Israeli society? Well, I guess one of the questions people are asking is, if we don't have access to Hebron, how do we have any right to Tel Aviv, for that matter? That's a very poignant mm -hmm. argument that, that the religious right makes. And I, I understand that argument. The problem is that, that just as I feel, as an Israeli, a, a, a deep historic claim to all of this little land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, even with the West Bank, Israel is still a very small place, there's a counterclaim. The Palestinians have that same claim to the totality of this little land. And for me to give up Hebron, in which Jews have lived continuously for 4,000 years. Who's buried there? Abraham and Sarah, the founders of the Jewish people, the, the biblical patriarchs and matriarchs. There's, there isn't enough, I don't think there's another people in the world <coughs> that knows the precise place of the burial of its ancient national founders. And we have that. And to relinquish our claim to that feels like a, a deep violation of, of, my, of my being. On the other hand, a Palestinian can make a very compelling claim about why the totality of this land belongs to their side. And the tragedy of this conflict is right versus right. And Partition, a two-state solution, is not a just solution. It's an unjust solution. It, for, to deprive me of, of, of Judea and Samaria, the biblical names of the West Bank, is unjust. To deprive a Palestinian of Jaffa and Haifa, which is today the state of Israel, is unjust from each of our points of view. The only way we're going to have peace is if we both agree to an un, a mutually unjust solution in which each side loses something vital of its, of its identity, of its being. I, I will not relinquish my claim to the West Bank, my emotional claim, but I need to relinquish my political claim if there's going to be peace, and a Palestinian has to make the same move. And there aren't enough people who think that way, and that's why you are where you are. Fair to say? Well, I, I would say that in Israeli society today, the position that I've just articulated would represent a majority of Israelis, along with a certain skepticism, which is that where are the Palestinians who are saying the same thing? Mm -hmm. And I would say that on the Palestinian side, there is probably a minority uh, who, would, who would affirm that position, maybe even a strong minority. I don't yet see a majority. 1995, Prime Minister Rabin is assassinated by a Jewish right-wing extremist and <clears throat> the character we talked about earlier, Yuel bin Nun, who wanted to rebuild the temple, has a particularly strong reaction to that event. What is it? It becomes the seminal moment of his life. Now, Yuel bin Nun, <clears throat> since after he was 12, goes on to being, be, being one of the paratroopers who conquers the Temple Mount in the Six-Day War in 1967. This is a... a for him, the, the, the peak moment, spiritually, of his life. And then he begins to understand the situation is more complicated. He moves on to become one of the leaders of the West Bank Settlement Movement, but his questions about where this is leading Israel are growing, especially in the sense that the settlement movement divides, bitterly divides Israeli society, and Yol bin Nun's whole being is, 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 is his, his whole his goal as an Israeli is to unify the Jewish people. So he has this deep conflict between his, his, his belief that <clears throat> we need to settle 
the West Bank, and, and the sense of dividing Israel. Now, when Rabin is assassinated, that is, in some sense, the worst moment of the Israeli divide. That's a civil war. An Israeli prime minister being assassinated by a fellow Jew, a right winger, who opposed Rabin because of his peace overtures to the Palestinians. Even though Yol bin Nun had opposed Rabin's peace overtures, he believed that it was doomed to failure. Nevertheless, he, he, had, he actually had developed a very strong relationship personally with Rabin. Uh, they, they developed a back channel where Rabin would, would, would sit with, with, with this settler rabbi, this right-wing rabbi, Yol bin Nun, and have long conversations about, about peace and territory and the meaning of Jewish history and, and where, where is Israel going. And, and so when Rabin is assassinated, Rabbi Yol bin Nun goes public against his own camp. And he says, we, the, the settler camp, helped create an atmosphere of hatred toward Rabin that allowed this assassination to happen. And Yol bin Nun then becomes the great heretic of the settlement movement and eventually breaks with the movement that he helped create hmm. and, uh, and has to leave the West Bank settlement that he helped found and becomes a kind of a spiritual refugee. Let's play this. I mean, it's impossible to tell the future, but let's sort of play it forward because I suspect, I suspect you're on pretty solid ground in forecasting what would happen if any potential settlement between Israelis and Palestinian Arabs would require some of these settlers to leave places where they are right now. Mm -hmm. And we saw when Israel tried to take down settlements in the Sinai, however many years ago that was. 1982. 82. Uh, I mean, how heartrending and how difficult that was. Mm -hmm. What would happen if the Israeli defense forces tried to forcibly, it would be forcibly, remove uh, ultra-religious settlers from these settlements as part of a comprehensive peace agreement with Palestinians? Well, it depends, first of all, on what the circumstances were. If a majority of Israelis believed that it was a real peace agreement, in other words, that the Palestinian side and the Arab world generally uh, were ready to accept the legitimacy of a Jewish state in the pre-67 borders, then my sense is that many of the settlers uh, would, even though they would continue to resist an evacuation, might do so more passively. If, however, there's a, a, an agreement in which many Israelis believe that, that it's a false agreement, the way many Israelis believed during the Oslo process of the 1990s when Israel was negotiating with Yasser Arafat of the, uh, of the PLO. Uh, if Israelis feel that the government is misleading itself and, and signing on to an agreement that is, um, is, is a delusion, I think we could see violence and, and, and even, even even widespread violence. Uh, this, will not be, this will not be easy. And presumably, that's one of the reasons why peace is not going to happen, because no Israeli prime minister wants to have to use Israeli army forces against his own people. Well, here's the thing. I think that, that if, if there were a Palestinian leader who were to say, we accept your legitimacy, and we have not heard that yet, we accept your right to exist. What we've heard from Palestinian leaders, even Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, who is relatively moderate, what they'll say is, well, you exist. But that's not good enough to Israeli ears. Because what, what Israelis feel this war is about, in essence, is the right of Israel to exist and to define itself as the homeland of the Jewish people that there are 22 Arab countries and 57 Muslim countries. There needs to be one country on the planet that is a place where Jews can, can immigrate to and be accepted as a people returning home, an indigenous people that have been exiled from its land that is now returning home. If the Arab world accepts the legitimacy of Israel, that Israel is an indigenous part of the Middle East, that we belong there, 
I don't believe that any Israeli prime minister, including a prime minister on the right, would turn a deal like that down, and most Israelis would support it and would accept the need to enforce a pull out of the West Bank, even at the risk of violence. Mm -hmm. And so f for me, I feel that the, the main obstacle to peace is not the settlements. The settlements are, are a byproduct of this conflict. The source of this conflict is the refusal of the Middle East to accept the Jewish state in any borders. And many Israelis, as a consequence of that Arab rejection, many Israelis concluded that, well, if they don't accept our legitimacy in these little borders, we might as well stake our historic claim to the whole thing. If the Arab world, or a substantial part of the Arab world, conveys to the Israeli public, we're ready to accept your legitimacy, genuine legitimacy, and there are certain ways in which in, in the negotiating issues, certain issues, for example, refugee return. If the Palestinians were to say, we accept that the descendants of the refugees of 1948, the Palestinian refugees, mm -hmm. will go back to a Palestinian state and not to the state of Israel, which would be a threat to the Jewish majority status of Israel. Uh, that would be a signal to the Israeli public that they're serious about accepting the legitimacy mm -hmm. of Israel. In our last minute here, I want to, you've received a lot of praise for the book, but there has been some criticism, and I want to share it with you and our viewers and get you to respond to it. Yeah, here's uh, something from the New York Times. It's hard to accept that in more than 500 pages, there is no attempt to present the perspective or experience of Palestinians, either those under occupation or those with Israeli citizenship. Mm -hmm. It is true that this is a book about the Jews of Israel, but they are not alone on the land, and the story of their struggle, viewed in such splendid isolation, feels, to say the least, short-sighted. So says that reviewer. What uh -huh. would you think? Well, uh, first of all, I was, I was thrilled with that review, and I was ready to forgive him his, uh, his momentary lapse of, of, of common sense. <laughs> because this is a book about, about seven Israeli soldiers. It's, a, it's, it's an Israeli band of brothers. Now, in all of my research, I did not find any Palestinians who were part of the Israeli paratrooper brigade. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I, you know, I think that, that had, had a Palestinian write, written a parallel story, this is a story of seven Palestinian fighters against the Israeli occupation from childhood uh, through, through, through their years of struggle. I don't think a reviewer of the New York Times would have said, hey, where are the Zionists in that story? <laughs> you know, every people has the right to tell its own narrative. Now, the Palestinians have a very strong presence in this book. In, in fact, they are, the, they are, in some sense, the central issue. But what interested me was how did Israelis filter this problem through their own sensibilities? This is an internal Israeli story. And, and every people, every nation, every ethnic group has not just the right, but the need to, to, to deal on its own terms with its problems. And this is a story about how Israelis try to, to grapple with a, a profound moral issue with, with, with deep, security, deep security problems, uh, an, an issue that goes to the heart of Israel's being, and how we took this left, right, and center from all of our different places and, uh, and it's a way to try to, in a way, it's to try to understand the Israeli soul. I would call it uh, a biography of the Israeli soul. And I hope that a Palestinian writer will write a parallel book about the Palestinian soul. Yossi Klein Alevi, it's always good of you to visit us at TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good to see you again. Pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.